Today we're talking about levers. Uh, now there's actually three different types of levers. These three different types of levers are differentiated from one another in how the input and output forces are arranged relative to the fulcrum. Now you'll notice for all three classes of levers, the arrangement of input and output forces relative to the fulcrum varies. The fulcrum being this pivot point on each lever. Now you'll remember the job of a simple machine is to take a force put into the simple machine and allow that force to act over displacement. And it converts that force over displacement or work or energy into some work or energy that is going to cause a force on the output side or an output force to act over some other displacement. Now, depending on the arrangement of, in this case, the lever, it might take a large input force and convert it into a smaller output force, or it might take a small input force and convert it to a larger output force. Just depends on how this is set up. So to get at how levers work, I wanna back up and, and start taking a look at work again. Uh, now you remember work is force times displacement times the cosine of the angle between these. Now in all three of these cases, uh, the force, both input and outputs, are perpendicular to the levers themselves. And so ultimately what that does is that turns this cosine theta term into one, always. So really we're talking about work as simply being force times displacement. So in order to discuss the displacement of a lever, let's let this input force rotate this lever around the fulcrum. Like this. So by pushing on the end of this lever, the lever is going to rotate, and we're going to say this rotates through some angle theta. Now, how large that angle theta is, I really don't care right now. What I'm concerned with is the displacement right here at the end of the lever. This is the displacement on the input side. By providing some force on this lever or putting a force on the lever over some displacement, work is done. We've put energy into the lever. As a result, there's an output force on the other end of the lever which is gonna act over some displacement. So we've got force times displacement in, force times displacement out. So we can mathematically show this as our work in, being our force in, times our displacement in. And our work out is going to be our force out times our displacement out. Now, assuming this lever has no friction on it and there's no resistance on this, this lever, we're gonna get the, the perfect situation where the energy that goes into our simple machine, the lever, comes out. And that is to say, the work in equals the work out. And what we can do with this is, is expand this out just a little bit. I wanna take these two terms and throw them in here and I'll show you why we're doing this. The force in times the displacement in equals force out times displacement out. Now nothing immediately pops out at us here as, as being any sort of huge or important revelation that we can have. But I want you to remember that I am a, the ideal mechanical advantage is D in over D out. That's how we mathematically define this. So if we could somehow connect or draw uh, a correlation between these displacements and the lever itself, then we could, of course, figure out the IMA of a lever. So what I wanna do is look at the geometry of this lever and really look at the length of each side of the lever. Over here on the left, you see, there's some input length. That is the distance from the fulcrum to where the force is applied. On the other side, over here, we have some output length. That is the distance between the fulcrum and the output. And so we can actually create a, a relationship between our displacements here and the length of this lever to try to get us to this, this formula for IMA so that we can relate this to the geometry of the lever itself. 
not how far it moves. So watch what happens here. Looking over here, we know the displacement in is going to be equal to the length of the input lever on the input side multiplied by the angle theta. And you're looking at this going, oh, that seems fishy. As long as this angle's in radians, this works out. And we see a similar thing on the output side. DO equals LO times theta. And so when we put all this together, we can see by combining this with our equations over here, what we're gonna get is FN LI theta equals F out LO theta. And while this doesn't seem like any sort of revelation, nor does this equation, I want you to realize the angle theta, whatever that angle is, it cancels out. And so what we're able to do here is we can look at the lever as a force and a length of the lever rather than its displacement. And here's what this does for us. This allows us to look at the IMA of a lever, not as the displacement on the input or output side, but we can also look at the IMA of this lever as being the length of the input arm over the length of the output arm. Looking at forces led us to this relationship. Looking at this with, with respect to lengths leads us to this relationship. And so here's the thing I want you to take away from this. On a first class lever, we can make the length of this input side as long as we want, and the length of this output side as long or as small as we want. So for a first class lever, we can actually have an IMA that can be any value. Because I can make LI very, very large, very, very small. I can do the same thing with LO. Now when I look at second and third class levers, on a second class lever, our input is always going to be greater than our output. So looking at this equation, which applies not just to a first class lever, but to all classes of levers, we can find that for a second class lever, the IMA, because LI is always gonna be greater than LO, the IMA will always be greater than one. We see exactly the opposite with the third class lever. The input is always going to be less than the output. And that means for a third class lever, the IMA is always going to be less than one. What does this mean in, in, in practical terms? With a second class lever, we're always going to be able to put a small force on the end of a long lever and get out of it a large force. But the trade-off, because we have to conserve energy, as we see over here, we're gonna have to pull the end of this lever a long ways to make this move a small ways. Because we have to satisfy this right here, and that is the conservation of energy as it applies to a lever. Realize, for a lever, the actual mechanical advantage is still going to be, as we've defined it before, the output force divided by the input force. So nothing has changed when dealing with levers as far as AMA. It's this IMA that's a little bit unique to levers so that we can look only at the geometry of the lever and not how far we actually push the lever in order to determine the IMA. So here we've got IMA and AMA for levers. Uh, how we apply these to specific situations, we'll take a look at it in a future video. And on that note, that's all for now.